On this team, we fight for that itch. On this team, we tear ourselves and everyone else around us to pieces for that itch. Coming, Coming in, in at 320 kilobytes per second. Per second. Ladies and gentlemen, 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 it's, it's time, time for Maddie C. Maddie C. C. Sports. 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 For you, you. you. and it me. me. When it comes to getting dough and chasing dollars. It's been 3,794 days since I've seen the old man. And not one goes by that I don't think about him. Watch things happen, make things happen, or wonder what happened. Right now we're making things happen. I wouldn't trade it for the world. <laughs> not one day that I don't compare my success to his. Hey, Jeff. How we doing, buddy? Good, man. Case is ready to go. But I never realized how big this could get. <laughs> Time to rock and roll. For any Marines in Hawaii, baby! Woo! My dad was Captain Phil Harris. Are you, buddy? A legend in the Bering Sea. I am a sweetheart. You can't get any better than me. I'm just a smiling jack. And he left me with a name. Yeah. Boom! Last year, when I found his charts of Hawaii, detailing a multi-million dollar Kona fishery, I started to unravel a mystery. It looks like your dad experimented with the most productive fishing depths around the entire island. Oh, like a... Oh. Now, armed with new leads, I'm heading back to the Big Island to uncover the old man's secret past and make his dream my reality. Right as the world turns upside down. Coronavirus pandemic ripples through Hawaii's economy. Boats sit idle on the docks, some stack four deep. But if my dad taught me one lesson, it's if anything's worth a damn. Wow. It's worth fighting for. <laughs> Shark. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, man. Oh my God, dude. I heard you guys might be hiring. Yeah. yeah, I got him. This thing is a monster. Oh my God. What is he doing? Fire. No. Oh, fire. You can't make it stop. Here we are. We really did it this time. All right, everybody. Welcome to Maddie C Sports with you and me. Special edition. So today I got a very special guest from the lovely state of Hawaii. Um, this man is pretty much, uh, a big name in Hawaii right now and, uh, honored to have you, uh, Jeff Silva from Deadliest Catch Bloodline and, uh, pretty much a local fisherman, local legend over there. Jeff, how are you this morning? Thanks for waking up so early for me. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. I'm good, man. I'm good. Things are really good. Just, uh. You know, we're, we're kind of slowly kind of getting back on our feet over here. And I know it's been a rough, rough running for a lot. You know, 2020 was kind of no different for us. So we're kind of slowly opening up our state and people are kind of slowly kind of coming back over here and, you know, kind of helping us do so. And yeah, man, life's good. No complaints. Very good. Very good. And um, so let's start off. I mean, um, so... I mean, have you you been in near uh, Kona most of your life down there, over there? I mean, like lived all yeah, your life. Yeah, so I'm that way? I'm born and raised over here. Yeah, so I'm actually born and raised over here on the Big Island of Hawaii. I'm actually uh, uh, I live in Kailua, Kona now. I'm actually from a little bit more southern part of the island, which is called Milali, and it's a you know really small fishing kind of community based. Uh, fishing based community where I, where I was raised with my father and my mother and a younger brother. And, um, 
I've been very lucky. I've always kind of called, you know, how about you, my home. And, and, you know, I've from surfing and paddling and fishing, I've always kind of been able to, to have a, a livelihood based out of the ocean. So I feel very, very, uh, very fortunate that I've been able to do so. It's, it's amazing how, like, like how beautiful it looks over there. I mean, is it like that pretty much every day? Just looking at like, I mean, I couldn't even imagine just looking out your window and just seeing the beautiful sunrise and, and the water, everything. Is it? Yeah. We're, we're so, we're so blessed. Like anything else, man, you know, we're, we're, you know, it's, it's a wonderful place to grow up. You know, it's, it's a lot slower lot slower pace of life and I think for I think for a lot of people that kind of grow up here it's 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 just it's just kind of um it's just kind of an accepted uh an accepted daily routine waking up you know seeing the sun seeing the ocean you know and and uh never taking anything for granted and I think that we're in a very special place over here and that's why so many people from all over the world want to come and visit and you know, learn our culture and share our traditions. And, and, um, like I said, I feel very, very, very blessed that I'm able to, and, uh, you know, provide for, you know, especially now with being uh, so involved in fishing, it's, uh, such a fun, neat way to, uh, to be involved, not just with, uh, with tourism, but my community and, and it just, uh, never gets old. I traveled a lot just, uh, with, through surfing and paddling and, um, I was never sad that I had to come home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think you're going to go to Boston anytime soon where there's traffic every five minutes and you don't know where, how long you're going to get home. <laughs> no, no, man. I've been to the East Coast. I've been, I've been to New York. I've, I've, I've done some, I've done quite a bit of traveling up, you know, through the East Coast. But, um, you know, it's, I, I, I actually love traveling. I love going all over the places. But like I said, you know, it's, it's always nice it's always nice coming home and I'm very fortunate that, you know, what I get to come home to, but you know, it's, uh, it, it, it is different for people. You know, it's, it's, uh, I see a lot of people that kind of come and go throughout the islands, whether they're visitors or they're actually people that come and maybe try to relocate and, you know, come try Hawaii, try to live here for the, you know, just to, just to start over or try something. And I see people that have success doing it. And then a lot of people kind of, it kind of shocks them. It's kind of like overwhelming for them to mm-hmm. actually be on an island. And just as fast as they kind of fall in love with the place, they, they, they kind of, it gets to, gets to a space where they're, they don't like not being able to go further than what we're just here, you know? So it's, it's, uh, you gotta be able to accept the living here. And a lot of it is, is, is just, you know, there's, there's a lot here. It's just understanding what it is, you know? Right. And like a, um, my cousin who lives in Waikoloa, a little bit north of you, right? Correct? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So she was telling me, um, you know, just like you said, like you either can stay there and be comfortable or it kind of like you're, you're just not fit to live there. And she loves it. I mean, the only thing yeah. that was kind of on the back burner was when COVID hit, like all the bars shut down and like she, kind of was out of losing money at that time. And um, COVID mm-hmm. was a big hit. I'm sure it was a big hit where you are or anywhere on the island. And um, yeah, I saw um, something that, you know, you've, I, I believe you've always done this, you know, you've gone with your business and um, gone with uh, supporting the local community anywhere that is in need of food or anything like that. And I can respect that because you know, it's a, it's a big thing. And I think it's true when you guys say, um, Ohana means, you know, family and stuff like that. It, it's truly like the Island is a big family and I respect mm-hmm. that over there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it, uh, you know, when, when I think when COVID hit, it was something for me personally, it, it, uh, it devastated our fishery over here. It devastated a lot of things for a lot of people. And in a way, and, and you know, for some people that they they might not they might not like what I'm gonna say, but for me personally, um, you know, it, it wasn't a it wasn't a bad thing. I don't think a hundred percent what happened over here, other than the health effects that happened to people. It was kind of like pressing the reset button, 
on life over here, which was we didn't have a lot of tourism. We didn't have a lot of business. Everything was just kind of at a standstill like what it was. But for us, you know, we were very lucky because we still had the ocean. We still had, you know, the mountains. We still had a lot of things that we can go and do. It was just generating an income doing it. Um, you know, last year we had the, me and my wife, we had to shut our, our fishing company down and we made an agreement that, you know, just because we, we couldn't go out and fish and make money, it didn't mean that we didn't have to not go out and catch fish to provide, you know? So we ended up kind of getting together with, with some, with some very, very, uh, generous people over here that we had a team that we just decided we were going to just try to feed as many people as we possibly could. And we, we didn't really set a goal. We just got involved with churches and, you know, um, some, we call them like, like Kupuna housing. And that's basically just kind of like, uh, like retirement homes and stuff like that, because oh, okay. we felt so bad for these people because they couldn't see anybody, man. I mean, it, I, that, that to me was like, that to me that they were at the most susceptible at that age where they couldn't get sick. But then at the same time, it just was devastating to them because they didn't, they couldn't have any visitors. They couldn't see their grandchildren. They couldn't see anybody. I mean, my parents live five minutes away from me and my parents were, they were freaked out to come and see, you know, to come and see my kids and come and see my family. And it just really turned this whole thing into like being scared of one another. And as Hawaiians, like we're not like that. We're very affectionate. Mm -hmm. people were very loving very giving and that was i think the hardest thing with covid was just not being able to not being able to greet somebody the normal way we'd greet them with like love and you know affection just all of a sudden you know having to to stay away from people and and it just uh it was very very different very difficult i think emotionally for so many people because they just felt they felt abandoned and we just kind of uh people would never know how far the gift of giving something simple like fish or trading something you know we were we were like old school bartering like giving fish for for pork or vegetables and it just turned into this whole thing where it was like money wasn't really a factor it was kind of like what you had and it was kind of like the way that i was raised so it was really interesting and it was kind of a really powerful time that in my life, I've never experienced anything like that. And I think that it was uh, my kids, it was, a, they're a little younger for, for them to kind of understand what's going on. But for a lot of the people that, that, that saw, I think that they'll look past the whole COVID quarantine and the shutdowns and all that. And I think that there was a lot of positive that was generated out from, you know, just this world just being closed down. It was, uh, it was a very, very good place to do it, which was over here because it, people still made you feel like you were loved people you know didn't forget about each other and it was it was more powerful that um it wasn't just a front of like you know that's what aloha is it was it was more of people's actions of what they were doing to help people survive and i'm i, was, I am so like respect respected by it for doing all that and you know like you don't have like I, I don't think you're one to flaunt anything at all. Like you, you seem like just a chilled out, relaxed Hawaiian who just enjoys life and fishing and, you know, catching the biggest tuna you can and all that. <laughs> and like, for you to tell me, like, you know, you're, you're helping out retirement homes and you're helping, you know, all in need. That's a, that's amazing to me. Like, and you don't have to like say, you don't have to go to your local newspaper and say, Oh, Hey, I did this or, you know, you just did it out of the kindness of your heart. And that's the stuff behind the scenes that, you know, I respect you more for not even trying to do anything crazy like that. So my one thing for you is, so I, I want to pronounce this right. Your fishing company, how do you, how do you say your fishing company? So my fishing company is pronounced Ula Ula. Okay. Ula, I'm Ula. just making sure yeah. I didn't want to say it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. It, part of, Part of learning Hawaiian is for us, for me personally, is the joy of watching guys like you try to pronounce it. That's half the reason that we name things the ways that we do. Okay, cool. Because I did buy a hat. So that we can listen company. to you guys try it. And that's the joy. That's the joy of any, uh, yeah. 
that's the joy of, of of learning any language is is learning how to try to announce something or pronounce something and you know um you know hawaiians when they when they when they made our language where you know our uh, our olelo as we call it it was uh they liked vowels man they used a lot of a's they used a lot of u's and they used a lot of words that that just kind of kind of carried off into into the abyss they kind of still go longer than you and me would ever know <laughs> <laughs> that's wicked cool though like i like how they, like it's like a whole nother language and i think that's so cool and like i don't know it's just cool you guys are so chilled out with things unless you know you're you're catching a tuna of course <laughs> um so with your so you join um mm -hmm. um jeff and uh Sorry, uh, Jeff and uh, Casey. I'm sorry. Uh, and jo so yeah, Josh, and, Josh and Casey. Josh and Casey. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm like half awake. <laughs> but um, no, no, what, it's all good, man. What uh, <laughs> what made you? What made them come to you in Hawaii? You know, it's a really good question. Um, the way I actually met. Casey was uh w w was very w w was very random very uh uh very basic basically I came in from fish I met him a couple of times because his family has had a has had a home over here for some while for for some time and I do know um I never met them but they're the 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 cast from Deadliest Catch from the big from the main show is actually a lot of those guys have come here to Hawaii for a long time. They've 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 come here and vacation here, and I believe some of them have even shot uh, like some cameos and a lot of a lot of footage for the sh for the shows. I, I I I know that they did things you know throughout here, but they never really had anything. It didn't have anything to do with the show that we were looking at doing, which is Bloodline. And I met Casey some years back i want to say maybe i met casey maybe six or seven years ago was the first time i actually saw him oh, okay. and met him and that, that was actually when he was just actually getting on um deadliest catch when i think he had just partnered up with josh on the cornelia and um i kind of saw him through passing through a mutual friend he'd go fishing and i'd see him out there and i think that he kind of you know uh just just from just passing in time and one day i came in from fishing and Oh, I think I caught some fish that day. I don't remember exactly what I had, but he was over in Kona with a bunch of his what a bunch of his friends and crew from from catch, and one of his buddies was getting married, and so he needed fish, and so he he wanted that he was trying to buy a fish off of me because he knew I had them, and um, make a long story short. I didn't sell him a fish. I ended up <laughs> in making kind of just a really big spread for him and his him and his team, his boys. And I made him a bunch of poke and a bunch of sashimi and a bunch of other stuff and just took it down. And and um, um, we just had a really fun night. And me and him just, believe it or not, stayed up late and had some drinks on his tailgate. And he asked <laughs> me, hey, what do you think about doing a what do you think about doing a show over here? And this is and this is the all this is the all honest truth. And I, and I just said, uh. I said, um, you know, I, 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 I don't know. He kind of planted, he kind of planted a seed. If I thought that, um, you know, like, like that we would be able to do anything. And I just said, yeah, you know, there's always a possibility of doing a show because at the time he was thinking about wanting to come over here, but we didn't really have anything solid as far as what the show would really be based around. And when he left, he went and did a, a remodel on the Cornelia Marie. Right. With Josh Harris. At that point, Josh, Josh, we actually and uh, when when Casey left here, when he kind of was saying, hey, what do you think about maybe coming over and, and, and checking us out? I, I just kind of took it with a grain of salt. I didn't really think it was anything was going to happen. And um, they went back home and they found they did this big remodel on the boat and they found a bunch of charts from Phil that were from all over. And one of the charts was what was from the Big Island. And so. um they contacted me and said, Hey, what do you think? And I did, I, and I looked at everything and I said, yeah, I, I think everything looks, looks good. And they, they said, I think we're going to, we're going to come over and give this a go. They kind of came, they, 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 they decided they want to come over here and kind of, um, you know, shoot this whole thing with Josh kind of pursuing his father's legacy. And, 
you know, I thought it was a great idea. I thought it was really, really strong. I thought it was uh, good. I, 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 I followed, I actually followed the show quite a bit, Deadly as Catch, and I actually followed a lot of the story between Josh and his father, Phil, and and I respected Josh for wanting to come over here and, you know, really learn more about his father's legacy, and it, it was kind of like a Hansel and Gretel type of thing where his dad kind of left all these all these breadcrumb trails, and Josh is just, you know, in this emotional state where he was just trying to, like, pick it up and, I think, you know, learn really the direction of what his father, uh, you know, had kind of left behind for him and his brother. And, you know, that was basically everything that he needed or all he needed to want to come over here and, 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 and kind of try this fishery out. And, you know, I, I watched the show for a long time myself and watching, watching Cornelia and then watching the Northwestern, like all those boats out there. And then mm. once they came to where you are in Kona and I was like seeing what you were all about. And then like when you first see like just piles and piles of tuna just like all across and i'm like oh my god look at all those fish mm -hmm. man mm -hmm. and you guys are just like like you made it seem easy and i know it's extremely hard and especially when you have one boat and you're like okay i have three here well, well you guys got like one <laughs> yeah yeah I'm like i'm like this is amazing like in all the stuff you were doing, like you, I was like, this dude's badass. He, like he's, he's mm -hmm. going doing all this stuff by himself. And like, it was mm -hmm. amazing. And like that, there was one particular episode where you, Casey and Josh were, um, you were going down in Kona South and, you know, you were on a rocky area and it was like thundering and like raining like mm -hmm. crazy. And you guys had a mm -hmm. like, not ditch the boat but jump out the boat and like swim and swim and like go up top and sleep but like what's it like sleeping on that stuff man that must be terrible yeah you know um you know a lot of it is our our island over here our island we actually we're called the big island is is we we refer to the big island as like the as like the big rock because mm -hmm. we don't have uh we don't have a whole lot of sand over here on our island. All the other islands kind of stole all of our sand, like Oahu <laughs> and Kauai and Maui. They took all the beautiful sand. So we got a lot of uh, really pristine, beautiful coastline, but it's what we call, it's called Pali. It's called like a bunch of, it's a lot of cliff, a lot of cliff, a lot of rocks. It's beautiful, but it's not really easy accessible. And that's kind of anywhere that you'll kind of go. And, you know, and that, that, that particular point, um in the show it was kind of really taking these guys out of their element you know what i mean they're so used yeah. to being on a big boat with having you know crew and um what they do respectfully is 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 insane in their in know, in their yeah. own in their own world um right. but what we're doing over here it's not far off from them. It's just different circumstances. We're on smaller boats. You know, most of the guys over here that are fishing, um, we, we, we grew up fishing by ourselves. And if we had a partner on the boat, most of the time it was either your dad or your uncle or one of your friends. If your dad was crazy enough to let you and your friend take his, take his boat out or something like that, you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. we, we, we you, you really just kind of get used to the outcrops of of what this island is and it's it's rock it's just mm -hmm. rock and cliff you know there is some sand throughout but that particular episode was really about these just getting these guys outside the element of where they were comfortable and especially josh i i really i really pushed josh in mm -hmm. uh on the show simply because this whole thing was kind of his adventure i mean yeah it's it was in it had kind of happened in, in my backyard, but at the same time, um, you know, I really wanted him to understand what it was that he was getting into, that it wasn't just going to all be, you know, sunshine and fairy tales. There was going to, there was a lot of possibilities of, of, you know, getting hurt. And there was a lot of things that he needed to learn, which was, you know, possibilities of breakdowns, not making it back in, um, you know, there's there, there's so many things that can happen to us out there. And I really wanted him to understand the nature of is that, you know, the ocean's always going to win. You're always going to be at the mercy of the ocean. And we're not on a 130 foot boat. We're on 19, 20 foot boats. Some guys are even on even smaller boats over here. 
So it was really him understanding the system when, you know, if we're on good fishing, we're not going to go all the way home. We're going to stay somewhere. Sometimes we're going to stay out at sea. And sometimes we're going to find maybe a little cove somewhere where we can kind of anchor up and maybe sleep on the boat. Or if there's a, you know, if there's a beach somewhere that we can kind of get to, you know, um, anything is, anything is possible over here. And I wanted to really make sure that those guys were aware that um, I wasn't going to baby them. I I really wanted them to learn that if they were going to do this over here with me, you know, they have to do it the way that I grew up and I didn't grow up a way where, you know, it was, uh, it was, it, it was really soft and easy. It, it, it was, it, it was a hard lifestyle, not a bad lifestyle, just, just the hard one. And that's to me, you know, they had a lot of catching up and a lot of learning to do outside of just only catching fish. They needed to learn, you know, there's a lot more that just comes with just catching fish over here. There's a lot of experiences that they've, that they haven't encountered. And that was just one, you know, not going home and, you know, sleeping either on the ocean or, you know, mo- you know, anchoring the boat so that when we wake up in the morning, we can kind of go back out where we knew that the fish were. So we'd be closer to this so that, you know, they could really understand what it's going to take to, you know, to, uh, for them to catch fish. Yeah. And it seemed like it was like more of like a survival and, uh, life lesson kind of thing like that. You were, you know, I, I know the elements were there, but like you were mm-hmm. like, trying to t- show them that like hey we we might have to sit here but we might have to like sleep somewhere or mm-hmm. you, you need to really pick your battles in in this water like you said the ocean never stops so no i mean i, I mean no. you, is it is there like a is there something like you you say a, a certain like fisherman's prayer or anything before you go out or anything like that like to just get your like mind and spirit like ready to go um yeah you know i'm i'm a i wouldn't say like i'm a i'm a i'm a very religious person but i do believe you know i do believe basically the way that i look at it is i look at the the ocean is basically my church that's how i look at it right and before i go before i go you know out to it's a little bit different of a church because you know it's it's uh you know there's there's I'm, I'm catching, I'm taking, I'm, you know, there's a lot that goes into it and mm-hmm. the oceans, you know, very powerful. I've always said that the ocean is probably one of the most powerful things is the most powerful thing in the, in, in, in the entire world, whether you believe in, whether you believe in a God or you believe in a religion or whatever it is, the ocean's no joke. The ocean no. will, the ocean will take you in a heartbeat. I've, I've, uh, I've lost people uh yeah. very close to me in the ocean i've seen you know from from diving to surfing to fishing you name it all it, it's you're just at the mercy you're just at the mercy of the ocean and you know the hawaiians were 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 very um very respectful of the ocean not just because the, the, you know they knew what it was and they were scared of it they also knew what the ocean provided for them they, it provided a whole uh was basically like their refrigerator you know, they would go in and they would collect, they would, they would dive, they would, you know, anything that they needed that they could possibly want food wise was there for them. And so a lot of it for me is, you know, I'm, 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 I fish 90% out on the ocean by myself. Um, there's days I have to go very, very far. There's days I'm not in communication with, with anybody or my family. And, um, it's just kind of more of a system where, you know, you mentally have to prepare people, people just think because a lot of times you're on really nice water all the time. You're like, Oh, well, it's nice there. And you know, it's, it's, it, it's 82 degrees. Um, you know, things happen all the time on a daily basis. Even if the water's nice, it doesn't matter. You know, there's a million things that can kill you on your boat. It's like the same thing on Delhi's catch. I mean, the, the ocean, the Bering sea is crazy, but more guys end up getting hurt on the boat than they do getting hurt by the ocean. And so, right. you know, it, it's, yeah. You know, to sum it all up, you know, mentally, you, you gotta, you, you have to put yourself in a mind state, you know, that you're, you're ready to handle all that, and uh, we call it a pulley. It's basically like a, just a small prayer, and I usually do like a really small prayer when I, when I leave the land. I just basically, you know, uh, I ask Keakua, which is, which is the, you know, the, the, you know, our God, my God that I believe in. I mm-hmm. ask him to watch over, you know, my family, my friends, and my loved ones, and I watch over uh, myself and you know to help me provide for what I'm out there doing and and then when I do catch something out there I always 
pray over that fish. And I say, I'm thankful for, you know, being given that fish because that's what I'm out there to do. And I'm thanking that fish because I've, you know, I've, I've taken that fish's life and I want, I want whatever energy is out there to know that that fish is going to provide for my family and it's going to go provide for people that, you know, that need. So it's just all in uh, a retrospect of just being grateful, feeling blessed and, you know, in some way, shape or form, you know, giving back. That to me is the only way that you're able to make, to make it work out on the ocean every day. And it, it seems like you're doing that pretty much as much as you can for your community. I mean, um, what is it that, um, is there a certain, I know you said there isn't like a certain goal you want to, um, have as a number, but I mean, I, I find that's really cool still that you guys still barter with, you know, fish for pork or any type of, um, food like that. Like, it, like, does it feel like much better that it's a bartering system? Like, I, I think that's really cool. Cause some people are just mm-hmm. like, no, I want straight cash. Mm -hmm. or whatever you know yeah i mean um you know last year with the last year with the pandemic with covid and it's still affecting us this year but last year it was actually almost a year ago it was almost a year ago march 17th 2020 was actually when we was actually when we just uh, all of our sales meaning that we we basically we had no market which meant that we had no fish sales so my company is a hundred percent sustainable fishing company which means we don't just go out and go fish or go you know go fishing just to go out and go fish and see what we can catch we I fish around my orders. You know, if, if I have big orders, lots of times I'll not just take my fish, but I, I have a lot of uh, other local fishermen that I work with and I try to work with them to really establish a market over here where I'm able to help, you know, our local fishery because we don't really have, we don't really have anything other outside the lines of, of, uh, you know, selling fish to local restaurants and stuff like that. So when all these local restaurants closed down, everybody kind of looked at each other like, well, what's what's everybody going to do? There was no answer from the state or from the government. There there mm-hmm. was like, I mean, you know, the there was some funds that were dispersed, but most of, as you can imagine, the big, you know, the big boats, the big fleets, all those boats, um, they were the ones that took a lot of that, a lot of those, uh, a lot of that funding was, was taken by, you know, the bigger fo- boats that have bigger overhead. And, um, you know, for, for us, it was, we were just kind of left with, with a survival mode and, you know, the, the guys over here, I've learned a long time ago that, you know, the guys that I fish with, that I grew up fishing with have turned into, in my opinion, some of the best fishermen I've ever seen in my life. And, you know, I've traveled all over the world, um, you know, through surfing and through paddling and um, fishing has always been something that I've just loved and enjoyed to do. And I've just kind of kept eyes on what guys are doing, even when I was maybe not even, um, even really fishing, I kind of just always paid attention. And the two things that I noticed were, you know, we have some of the best fishermen I've ever seen over here from charter boat fishermen to shoreline fishermen to divers to, uh, you know, to commercial fishermen to just recreational fishermen. Everybody over here grew up fishing and these guys can fish like for real. And um, I'm very, very blessed that I have fishermen like that over here, not just on the big island, but even in the entire state all around the islands. These guys over here know how to provide for their families. And so whether there was an industry or not for them to sell, they were, they, it was just like a chain effect. Everybody kind of saw that everybody needed help in their own ways. And, and a lot of fishermen, a lot of guys stepped up and really helped out so many people. And it wasn't something that was done for social media or for fame. It was just done because people needed help. And that was right. yeah. kind of how we always grew up in our heart. We knew that, yeah, no matter what, you know, you're going to provide for somebody that needs it. You're going to give over sell. That's that, that's the bottom line. And, you know, our industry last year, it, it, it collapsed. And um, like anything, we, we struggle with a lot of the bigger, some of the bigger boats um, that fish on the outside because they're able to fish further out than we can get to. And obviously their boats are a lot bigger. They can hold a lot more. 
mm-hmm. fish than us. And when they come back in, a lot of these boats sell to the same markets and it's, it's nothing illegal. It's just, it's just the way that it is. They're going further. They're, they're able to catch more. And when they come back in, they're selling to the same fish brokers that, you know, that other guys are selling to. And it's really, really easy if people aren't here taking the fish, it, it just floods out where there's no price and the fish isn't really being moved. And it's just something that's, uh, it's scary. And so for our company, for my company, we decided to go a lot more in a direction of sustainability, which made it more about one fish being caught and making the struggle. My goal was to really show the struggle on the show. I wanted Mm -hmm. to show every person that, you know, that likes to eat fish, whether it's, it's, you know, here or far, the struggle of what it takes to catch one of these things. It's, it's not easy. And there's not, there's less and less and less of them around. They've gotten smaller over the years. And, um, you know, to me, it's something that needs to be noted that, you know, we're impacting our fishery, our, our fisheries on a, on a life threatening scale. And we can't look at selling fish in our industry the way that we've been doing it for the last 50, 60 years, or there's not going to be anything left. So I don't really like, uh, I don't like the direction of where our industry is going about catching mass, uh, catching mass megatons of fish. I'm actually against it. And so for me personally, I like targeting one fish at a time. And my goal is to raise the price of these one fish, which has actually never been done. We've got the same fishing prices over here in Hawaii now that we have since, you know, um, when I was a young kid. Oh, and the, no the, 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 the price of fish when I grew up was in, in between, you know, three to four dollars a pound. I remember that's what my dad used to get when I was young, when I was my son's age, seven at six or seven. And believe it or not, um, the price will even go lower than that over here. And, and there's not even as much fish around. So there's really not a big, there's really not a lot being done fishing wise uh, that's really looking out for guys to fish in this week. We're being known as like the small being done. Personally, um, you know, it's a very controversial thing, but I believe in it that we need to change the way that we're selling our fish. Because if we don't, and we keep chasing this thing where we're constantly trying to catch, you know, tons and tons and tons of fish. There's just not going to be enough around to supply the world in the future, you know? Right. And, and where I'm from, Massachusetts is a big, big fishing industry as well. I mean, we have lobster, we have all this type of, um, you guys got bluefin up there. Yes. Yes, we do. And also, as you know, like we have the guys from like wicked tuna, they're from up here. And, you know, Mm -hmm. they're going down south and there's just a lot of fishery everywhere. And like Mm -hmm. you said, when mass boats are coming in and just sweeping them all out, you're you're not only hurting the population of the fish, you're also hurting the fishing industry for guys like you who work hard to do this stuff. And, you know, that's the it's the most unfortunate part of, you know, your guys' business. But I I respect how you guys like. I, I like how you put it as the different types of industry of fishing, like divers, mm-hmm. and you guys and stuff like that. Like, it's cool that you guys are all a family over there. Mm-hmm. So I, I hope fishing stays good and I hope the prices go up for you. And my final question to you is, um, so what, what is your future plans, Jeff, for from now on in? You know, my future plan that is, is things are kind of slowly turning back on over here in Hawaii. And, you know, we've, we, we've got, we've, we're slowly as a state opening back up, which is, which is, which is very good. We've got, you know, really kind of tight travel restrictions, but it, that's it's going to have to do whatever it takes to kind of get our community back on its feet. And it's, it's going to take some time. It's, we're not out of the woods yet, but slowly we're, we're, uh, we don't really have a whole lot of, uh, we don't really have a whole lot of cases over here of COVID, but at the same time, we've got enough to where our government feels good. Mm-hmm. We're opening back up. And what that does for me is it, it's, it, it opens our industry back up to where we can kind of start fishing and start selling again, you know? And um, that to me means everything because I'm able to build, you know, my company and I'm able to help out 
more people and more fishermen and we're, we're generating revenue again and we're slowly kind of getting back into it. But, you know, as I said earlier in um, this whole thing for me personally is kind of hit the reset button. And I learned a lot about my company. I learned a lot about people and this is both kind of on and off the show. And it's been really good, a really good building template for me to move forward with, uh, you know, with Casey and Josh and really evaluate what is necessary in Ula Ula Fish Co. so that we can basically build the best sustainable fishing company that we can do that people are happy with our product and they respect our service. And a lot of that is, is coming from, you know, what I've kind of told, you know, been talking to you about that, uh, you know, they need to understand that there's not a lot of fish around anymore. And um, we're trying to make these fish, we're trying to make these fish special so that when every time someone eats them and they enjoy them, they know that it comes from, it comes from a fisherman like myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that's important, really making people aware that that's the direction of fishing that we need to go. We need to think about our, you know, our, 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 our cakey, our kids, their, that generation of fishing, because if we don't, there's just not going to be fish around. So that's really my goal moving forward in, in life, in business, is just to really try to be the best, uh, be the best partner, you know, best fisherman, best husband, best dad that I can be. You know, I got a family. I got, I got three kids. I got a wife. And, you know, it's a, it, that's always the struggle of fishing is finding balance in life to make everybody happy. You know, I know it. whether it's a client, whether it's a client or it's mom, you always got somewhere to be. And, 2020 was a hard year for a lot of people and uh, we worked really hard and um, you know I'm happy to announce we have season two of Delhi's Catch Bloodline coming out here in about three weeks I think it's going to premiere somewhere I want to say somewhere around mid-April on Discovery Channel and I think that it's going to be a, a really really strong powerful season I think a lot of people will be able to relate you know kind of what happened and I also think that a lot of people are going to kind of look to the show as kind of an escape to see you know, what really happened, how we were able to get through this pandemic. And uh, there was a lot of, there was a lot of trials and a lot of tribulations and a lot of emotion that went into, that went into season two. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Jeff, uh, thank you very much for your time. And I know you got some fishing business to do right now. So uh Thank you for coming. I, do, on I don't know show. if you've, I don't know if you've noticed, man. I'm sitting in my truck, man. I got I got my box in the back. I'm actually I'm actually getting ready to go do a delivery. So, I'm uh I'm I'm I'm, I'm as soon as I hang up with you, I'm 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 boogieing out, and it's Saturday. I'm gonna go drop I'm gonna go drop my fish, and I'm gonna go enjoy my day. So, I love I'm, it. Man. Uh, I'm super. Yeah, I'm super stoked. I got to do this with you. This was really cool, you know. And um, you know, I I I, I really appreciate you having me on and. And uh, yeah, man, it's been it's been a blast talking to you. Oh yeah, same with you, man. So next time I come over there, don't uh, please let me on your boat, and then don't take me <laughs> to thirty foot waves. I <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's the ocean, man. I can't promise you anything on the ocean, but yeah, I, I, it would uh, would definitely be cool to link up. And um, again, man, I, I really appreciate your time, and and uh, yeah, let uh, we'll definitely do this again. It's been fun. Same to you, brother. And uh, stay safe and bless you every day you're on that water. Stay safe, man. And uh, spend good time with your family, man. Same to you, man. Same to you.